Welcome to Careers Unwrapped, where we delve into real-life career stories from successful people who've been through it all, the ups and the downs. We'll get their raw, honest, actionable advice and be the careers talk they wish they'd had when they started out. As someone who has had a varied career, from soldier to salesman, expedition leader to entrepreneur, he knows firsthand that your career doesn't always lead you where you expect it to. Here's your host, Mark Fawcett. Hello and welcome to Careers Unwrapped. I'm your host, Mark Fawcett, and today we're revisiting some of the greatest hits from Careers Unwrapped so far. Careers are rarely straightforward. They're full of highlights, dead ends, opportunities, and sometimes mistakes. So we've pulled out some of the more thought-provoking discussions, the inspirational stories, and the insights into how successful careers have been built across many, many sectors, as well as the personal journeys our guests have ventured on. So sit back, relax, and get ready to be inspired. In our first segment, reflecting on a moment from Camilla Holden Ayala's episode, where she discussed her journey into the PR industry, from her introduction to the sector of public relations as a young woman with a lot of positive confidence and attitude, she attributes much of her early successes to her ability to be able to put herself in the room and ask point blank if there was a job, with manners, of course. She shares invaluable tips on how to start from the ground up. So then you went to university, you did history and politics. How did you break into the industry that you clearly love being part of now? So I was very fortunate to go to a lot of world travel markets, which is basically a travel trade fair. And it was there that I met a minister of tourism. And that minister of tourism, I just kind of got chatting. I was very... I was that obnoxious little kid that would walk around and be like, hi, nice to meet you. Sorry to interrupt. And it would be, you know, like CEO of whatever or, you know, minister of ambassador for this. And I would just be like, hey, nice to meet you. I'm Camilla, blah, 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 blah. And we got to talking and then I must have said, you know, oh, I'd be interested in public relations because I'd watched Sex and the City with my mum many a moon ago. And there was a character on there that I loved. Whatever it was that she did, I then found out it was public relations. But at the time I was like, oh my God, she's amazing. Like, the gumption that she has, the confidence, like she's clearly making money from it and she's got a huge, bold personality. Like whatever she does, I want to do that. I don't know what it is. My mum was like, she's a PR. And I was like, one day that'll be me. And so when I stood in front of this man who was the Minister of Tourism, a very senior person, I was like, I want to work in PR. Have you got any jobs going? And he was like, you seem like a, you know, happy-go-lucky type of person. I'll put you in touch with my colleague. And then he dropped me an email and I was literally on the way home, like to the train station, like emailing the guy like, hi, so my name's Camilla. You, I've got passed on your email by so-and-so. Could I jump on a call? And yeah, I just said, I'd love to work in PR. They happen to have a PR assistant role going in their PR team abroad. And then I deferred from uni, told my mum I'm making my bags and I'm going to Mexico. And I got on a one-way ticket to Mexico and just said, here I am. And then... I started working in the Yucatan Tourism Board, so a regional tourism board in Mexico. And then, yeah, it kind of just snowballed from there, I guess. So we're pulling together pieces of a jigsaw here in a way. So despite influences about saying you should be a diplomat, others saying you should probably just be a little quieter, and and a degree that was separate from this, there are pieces where you're starting as you go through to pick up what you like. And what excites you, even if Sex and the City is an influence that, which is one of the first I've heard of Careers Unwrapped. But we can all take these little pieces as we see them, as we travel through early life, going, I like that, I don't like that. Can there be careers and jobs and roles and things I can do out of that? And how then did you move from working in, in tourism to what you're doing now? What were the steps on that path? So when I was still in Mexico, I was already kind of asking myself, like, right, I've got to come back to finish my degree. Like, I have to come back. So there is going to be a cutoff point to this experience in PR. I've loved it so far. What could be the next option? I I literally just used to sit there in the evenings after work and just Google travel PR agencies London. And then through that, and then obviously loads of names were coming up. And I was just Every day, just going back and looking at this agency, looking at the next one, looking at the next one. Who do they work with? What type of team do they look like they have? You know, what type of clients do they look like they have? What sort of work does it look like they do? 
And then it was only just through going through. And I thought, you know what? I've done travel. I've done travel PR. I really enjoyed sort of, I've always loved the 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 idea of of traveling the world and meeting different people, seeing different cultures. And so I thought, right, this this is perfect. Travel PR, this is for me. Next step. And then I just said, well, worst case, if I email 100, one's bound to come back and at least on, e- offer me an interview at the very least. And so I literally was just sending my CV to every single travel PR agency that I could find saying, hi, my name's Camilla, attach my CV, blah, 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 with a little cover letter or a little cover note. And one of them came back eventually. And then a few more started to come back. And I just started to go on a few interviews. And then there was one travel PR agency who offered me the job. And I just said, I, I fudged a little bit on my CV, won't lie. Um, fudged, I, or embellished slightly parts of my CV. And I think it was funny at the time, there were, I had a lot of experience that I, I didn't, I didn't know it was experience almost. I'd, I'd, I'd done little ad hoc jobs, you know, with, you know, my mum's friend or a friend's parent. Or I'd, I'd done little odd jobs here and there that I didn't realise the skills and experience that I picked up from that was either actually PR or comms or in some sort of way. So I'd had that experience. So technically it wasn't fudging too much, but that then helped me to, you know, bulk out my CV, even though I didn't have oodles of PR experience. I bulked it out with all the, you know, little odd tidbits that I'd done here and there. And then it just kind of just kept going. And then I loved public relations. I was like, wow, this is great. I was like, what is this? And then, yeah, it just kept going. Following on from Camilla's segment, reflect on a powerful moment from Keelan Park's episode, where he shares his personal experiences dealing with racism as a young police officer, a job he loves serving within the Metropolitan Police. Looking at the prejudices he faced, Keelan's rich perspective on the topic offers depth, wisdom and empathy at a time when all three are immensely needed. You mentioned at the beginning that when you first thought, hang on, this is the direction I want to go in, that some members of your family, your friends, the Jamaican community, and although you say it with a smile on your face, they obviously seriously questioned what you were doing. But the Met has also, in recent years, had some pretty mixed press, and especially accusations of racism within the Met, accusations of prejudice in many forms, accusations of misogyny. How do you, as somebody inside that, feel when you hear those comments in the media or from those who are observing the work of the police? So for me, I worked in Brixton for a couple of years and every single area in London, every postcode has a different police in history. May it be positive, may it be negative. When I joined, I can say I was not equipped and I wasn't well versed in the history of Brixton and how the Met treated the Jamaican community, the Windrush generation, all sorts of things, which is somewhat still ongoing, um, the relation tensions. When I joined and black people in the public were racially abusive to me, absolutely hated my existence. It took me about a month, five months till one of them said, do you know the history of the area that you're working in, the organization that you're working for? And I said, nope. And he said, go read this and watch this. So I did that. Ever since that, the ability to resonate with people it's been untold. Um, for example, being at a crime scene and they come and they insult, you know that's not personal. I've learned that it's not personal, but I'm not going to invalidate them and say, no, that wasn't me. It wasn't me. Things that happened before I was born, which is what it is, as horrible as it is, but I can't deal with that. But what I do is I tell them what I would do and just be genuine because the thing about it is they have a lot of frustration and I'm probably the closest thing to a police officer and a son at the same time that they've come across. So. I let them vent. And also you spoke about the, for example, media. I mean, it'd be interesting because media for me, it's like dragon fruit. I don't know what dragon fruit tastes like, so I would never go around talking about it. If the media is another bit of police officer, I doubt they should go around talking about it unless they are a subject matter expert. Now I can feel like I can give advice about what police is truly like. Prejudice within the policing, you said a bias earlier, it comes in many, many forms. Overt bias, stereotyping, racial profiling, and microaggressions. Previously playing football, people are footballers. They weren't their ethnicities. And I could say because I wasn't previously paying attention to different races, it wasn't a thing that I would ever do. Policing was the first time I was actually trained in unconscious bias. 
that's the honest truth. I started on a force, which was predominantly white. Not an issue. The officers on my team were very well first in how to speak to the locals, but the locals didn't like them, which is, it is what it is. However, there was a culture of instantly thinking that a black youth had done something wrong. I've had to address that. I realized there's a lack of empathy, which obviously fuels public's opinion of us if we're going to a call and we're treating them badly. So it's all about the little things. Often when I challenge the white officer about their unconscious bias, they would say, yeah, but, and I'm like, it's not, yeah, but it's what I'm saying and what you're saying. It doesn't cancel one out. We just have to learn off each other. There's been times that obviously I'm quite vocal, so I get called troublemaker and stuff like that. But I'm like, if I'm doing something right, then can't complain. But that's also something that a black person is called within organizations where you don't follow suit. So I've been very vocal about transgressions, microaggressions, everything. And people have been more aware of how they speak to members of public and how they approach situations, type of force they use. But yeah, it's very interesting having learned this from the age of 22. Yeah. And from your experience, do you think the Met Police is now a better place? for a young black man from London to go into than when you first went into it? Yeah, I could say when I first got here, um, for example, Gravesend, where they train officers to use firearms and public order and other things, see of white faces, but they're all men. Within the past seven years, I'm walking into there now and I'm seeing diversity. People are feeling comfortable enough to say, I think I made a mistake. Like people asking about stereotypes or rumors about cultures. People are willing to honestly jump into a space or learn about cultures that aren't theirs, whereas it was a bit fragmented before. It used to be this thing where it doesn't affect me, so I don't care. But now, like I say, with senior leadership, with the rise of Black people coming in, I say Black is relevant to me, but there's different diversities. Yeah, it's a more fruitful place, and especially with the fact of careers, development leads, for example, we, as in the minorities, face issues when it comes to promotion. I used the career development lead who put me onto a training course and spoken to other colleagues and I've done my exam and I've passed my sergeant's exam. That wouldn't have been a thing how many years ago. I would have been supported. But now I'm in a space where I'm seeing change and where it comes to cultural change, it's there's learning that hasn't been done but it hasn't been done yet. So it's healthy. They're letting me do things like double the outreach team. My department is all about diverse recruitment. So that wouldn't have happened how many years ago? Next, we look at a moment from Nicola Bird's episode. As a woman working in construction, she faced various gender-related conflicts. However, through the challenges she encountered, she's managed to rise above them and build a fruitful career. And this episode in particular showed her determination and her focus and how both of these can help you overcome any career challenges well yeah going back to my dropping out my a levels that didn't work you know, and when i left school yeah i can you know met people thinking oh god you know what's she doing where's she gonna go and having a family at such a young age and getting married so young and you know still married now there's still a success <laughs> that one's still in the bag i got that one and I did, a, I remember doing a construction course and this is for my first, very first health and safety qualification. And I failed that miserably because I hadn't had enough experience out of sight. Um, but I went back and did it again and passed the second time. So yeah, there have been a few failures along the way, but <laughs> to, you know, you learn, you without doubt learn from those. It just brings you back stronger. You mentioned about the challenge at times of being a woman in construction. How has that manifested itself in reality in your life? Where have you found things thinking this is happening because I'm a woman or because of uh, someone else's attitude towards me? What have you felt you've really had to overcome? Oh, just being heard, I think, and having voice and opinions and having them being respected or just listened to. I do still think sometimes, you know, I am, I'm still relatively young in the business sense. And so I still sometimes have my doubts. You know, there are so many people I can learn from and that have been in there way more many years than I have. But it doesn't necessarily mean that my points and my views aren't valid. 
So it's trying to get people to see what I can see from a different perspective because I, I bring something different and the board I'm on, I'm the only one, there's nine of us and I'm the only female. And of course, I'm going to bring in a different perspective. It doesn't mean it's right, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just something different. And I read yesterday that the proportion of women in the broader construction industry, depending on who you get your numbers from, is somewhere between about 13 and 16%. What's your experience with the education you're providing now at Axel? Is that the sort of level of students and learners coming to you, or is it different? It's a lot less. You know, it is a massive, massive goal of ours to try and bring in more women. The challenge we have at the moment is still bringing in people. <laughs> so regardless of whether they're male or female, and we still need people in the industry, it's hard enough trying to get still boys interested in it as a career. And the women will come. And that, the thing with what we're doing here, so it's run by my sister and I, and there's a, well, this 50-50 split, the team we've got here, which shows clear representation of diversity. And that's giving girls more opportunity to come here and because they can see it and they can understand it and they can have those chats. So it's giving them just more of a choice. It's about having choices at the end of the day. I don't ever think we'll get, probably get to a 50-50 split. I think that's unrealistic. But we'd like to get somewhere around the 25, 30% mark would be nice. And now you also hold other leadership positions in construction bodies around South Wales and Gloucestershire. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your board memberships and chairs that you've done elsewhere? I'm not doing it now, but I have been the chair of Working Well Together, which was in South Wales. That's a health and safety initiative run by the HSE. So again, that was something sort of really to get some more insight for my career. Again, speaking to the right people in the right places, again, gaining more knowledge and having a bigger network. I'm also, although they're wrapping up, a board member of the LEP, which is a local enterprise partnership. That after our huge success here, when actually before I had the funding, I never knew what an LEP was. <laughs> and I would probably go for about 80% of members of the public as well. After that, that, I joined as a board member because I could see the value in what they gave back to the community. You know, it's transformed this local area. And I really wanted to be a part of something that could do more of that. And in that, I'd like to touch a little bit upon leadership. Because you, you're a chief executive, so you have to be a leader, but you've been a chair, which is a different form of leadership. And you've also been on boards, sometimes very male-dominated boards. So can you describe a little bit about perhaps your approach to being a leader and what you've learned about leadership? Uh, yeah. And I've been on a very kind of up and down journey, I guess, on my leadership journey, trying to understand who I am. I'm not a shouty person. So I was brought up in a family business that was run by two very, very strong males. And I always thought that if I was ever going to take on the business, I'd have to replicate that. I'd have to be strong. I'd have to be very direct to have any chance of being respected. And it was only till I really sort of started going on my own leadership journey and finding out who I was that I started to be more true to myself. Yeah, and I had to say more like more woman than man as well, just being more me. And I actually started to get way more respect and way more out of my role. So I started to really understand that I could be more who I am. And that is very sort of democratic. I'm very, I'm, I'm a coacher rather than a dictator. We've met both types as well before. <laughs> I've tried both and I'm much more suited in being true to myself than anything else. That comes with the challenges because I, not being direct is not the best in a business leader. So you've got to have a good balance. And that's something I've been working on, trying to be a little bit more direct with people because some people want to be directed and they don't want to be coached and they don't want to have opinions. They want to come to work and you, they want to be told what to do. So you do have those mix of people. And, and for some people who want to come to work and, and be instructed on what to do, they find me really frustrated. In our penultimate segment, we revisit a moment from James Tanner's episode where he discusses his experiences with leadership inside the kitchen. Although typically depicted as an aggressive working space, James explains that chefs and the working kitchen thrive best when there's respect, a principle he believes applies to all good leaders. In his conversation, he highlights the power that respect and kindness have on a team. In your experience what makes the difference between 
a good chef and a great chef, what's the attitude, the skills that you think lifts the top people? I just think it's their, their dedication and talent and skill. And there's some chefs that have worked for unbelievable people and done some wonderful things. And there's other chefs where they've got natural talent and it's not been necessarily drummed into them or taught to them. Um, it's something where they've done it through their own trial and error and inspiration. The thing is with this trade, and I find it now, everyone's still learning all the time. And even so, food trends change and techniques change. There's techniques now that's used I wouldn't have even dreamt of or known of. I'm still learning, well, still learning now. I think that's the good, exciting thing. Um, what makes a good chef stand out? I think he's someone that appreciates the team around them, is willing to do whatever they put onto somebody as well within the team. And I still carry that ethos now within our crews that we work with. And it's just someone that's understanding and got a good temperament about them, hasn't got a big ego, and it's not all about them. It's about what you're producing. The most important thing is, and I always say this to the guys, are the customers. The customers, if you don't have customers, you can be the best chef in the world. But if you can't produce it and make a business work out of that, you can be a great cook, you can be a great chef, but you've got to have that mindset and talent for it to work and run a business as well. And it's not just about running the kitchen. Um, there used to be years ago a bit of a divide with front of house and kitchen. We look at it as one. Um, you've got to have team briefings. You've got to have respect for the people that are going out there and facing the customer. And you might be put up with dietary challenges or someone that wants something different. And can we do this? And can we do that? And it's how you adapt on your feet on the spot. And yeah, that's not easy to do. And it's something that you've got to have an open mind about. So I think you've just got to have a general well, a good sense about a thought for who's around you and what you're producing as well. And you do need that bit of talent at the end of the day, obviously. But I mean, some of the things that people are producing now, food wise and what I've seen in the past and what we try and do is, I just think it's brilliant. It's exciting. And you mentioned there a, a lack of ego, yet I think some of us might associate with the top chefs quite a lot of ego. And how does that come across in a positive way? The ego that gives them the confidence and belief, but also manages to get a team of people to work behind them. I think it's with the word ego, as long as you're not coming across arrogant, if you're coming across inspiring or you're coming across motivating, and it's giving you that end product, that's different. Anyone can stand some in any profession and be greamy, shouty, and everyone to like drop their feet around them and everything else like that. But life's not like that. And you don't get the best out of people like that. Respect people around you and think, be treated how you'd want to be treated. And I just think that's more important than anything, really. And yeah, the media and the documentaries and films, yeah, it is that grabbing moment it does get people's attention it's like a screamy shouty chef but also part of that is somebody's passion because they want it to be right but i still think there's a way you should once you conduct oneself and how you go about that and last but certainly not least we go back to our very first episode and we revisit bushan seti's reflections on the unique superpowers that everyone possesses and how they can use them in the workplace he discusses the importance of hard work and absorbing the work culture of any environment you're in. And he encourages people at home to focus on building core skills and discovering each of their superpowers to stand out. In relation to that, one of the questions sent to us by one of our career starter listeners has been about how you set yourself apart from others during your career in order to drive your own success and achieve what you wanted to. How did you differentiate yourself and rise above the competition? I love this point on um, how to differentiate yourself because the advice I try and give to teams that I manage is you're not competing with each other, the tide will lift all boats. But if I go back to my early self, the way I tried to differentiate myself was just working hard, being a voracious learner, working long hours, learning every single thing around the topic. If we were asked to kind of put together financial reconciliations when I worked in accounting, I would try and understand the business model, the strategy, 
what they were doing with that, et cetera, and try and kind of overachieve. And so I just kind of worked, worked really hard. Then I realized in my kind of mid twenties, when I got my first consulting job and, and spent some time in the U S that everyone has superpowers. I realized one of my superpowers, maybe this is growing up in large families, et cetera, was connecting the dots. As people were talking about the financial side of a decision, someone was talking about the customer technology side, someone was talking about the consumer side. I had the ability to connect all of those dots and sound really smart. I understood finance and process and technology and come up with a holistic solution. And I realized that not everyone could connect those dots as quickly as I could. And so if you couple that with my more confidence around public speaking at the time, I was able to kind of articulate things, even taking other people's ideas and kind of make them sound better. So the point I'm trying to make is build some core skills, but everybody does have superpowers. It could be the way you communicate. It could be how you show up and you're really relatable and authentic and everybody likes you. It could be that you've got some lived experience. You've grown up, a, you know, you've come as a refugee. You've got a different lived experience of a different part of the world or a different way of growing up that no one else in that room has. And that's your superpower. It could be something, you know, sporty. So really understand and that's really how you can differentiate. But, you know, there's a big business community out there. We have labor shortages all over the world. We have skills constraints all over the world. Anyone who works hard is focused on learning tries to be kind and compassionate, there's going to be ample opportunities, I hope, and I believe in the business world. We don't have demographics on our side. It's not like we have population explosion around the world. We actually have population decline scarily. And so it's not a case of, is there enough jobs and can I differentiate myself? It's how do we kind of unleash and nurture the creativity out of people so that we can actually get everyone to you know, maximize the potential you know, at a certain point in their life. So thank you for joining us on this special episode of Careers Unwrapped. We hope you enjoyed revisiting these inspiring moments and gaining valuable insights from our incredible guests so far. From Camilla Holden Ayala's journey into the PR industry, Keelon Parks' profound experiences with racism, Nicola Bird's challenges and triumphs in construction, James Tanner's leadership lessons from the kitchen, to boost Sunsetti's empowering thoughts on discovering your unique superpowers. Each story highlights the diverse paths and resilience needed to thrive in today's world. Thank you. This podcast is sponsored by We Are Futures. To find out more about We Are Futures and how we can introduce your brand, business or organisation to the mass markets of tomorrow, visit www.wearefutures.com. Make sure to search for Careers Unwrapped in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Remember to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at We Are Futures, thanks for listening.